she moved here. So, um, and she was three years old at the time and uh, never went to school uh, and only learned English when she was about 12 years old and her, she moved to, came to Saskatoon as, to work as a, a domestic servant. <coughs> and then uh, after that, uh, the war broke out, the First World War, and so she then pretended that she was uh, Scottish. She uh, changed her last name from Cameron to Cameron and, uh, and sort of played, tried to play the role of a Scotswoman um, uh, for the rest of her life. She, uh, my mother only learned that she was of German ancestry when she was about 10 or 11 years old, and it was sort of disclosed to her by her mother. So, so uh, although I, I didn't grow up in a German home, I uh, have German ancestry, and uh, I'm very interested in that ancestry and to make those connections. So today in Canada, there's over 3 million people who claim to be of German ethnic origin, uh, and of course, uh, this, though, is a very diverse community, as, as you know, if you're involved at all with the German Cultural Association here um, and, and the diversity just within the city of Saskatoon, the, the German, German people, German heritage, German language, uh, it's an inc incredibly diverse community that most non-Germans don't appreciate, don't understand. The Germans who came to the prairies in the late 19th and early 20th century came from a, a wide range of places in Europe, and in fact, most of them uh, did not come from what would today be considered German territory, the, the country of Germany today. They came from other places. <clears throat> the vast majority of Germans came to Canada from what was at that time uh, the Russian Empire, uh, and in particular this section of the Russian Empire. <clears throat> and a significant percentage also came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Of course, the borders between those empires have moved back and forth a few times. Uh, but, but that was where the majority of the settlers here right now, so if, you, if you're a second or third generation German in Saskatchewan, that's likely where your ancestors came from. Within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and that area, again, it, it sometimes shifted, it was, it was uh, um, Russian as well, uh, it was the province of Galicia, uh, again, that's where my, my family comes from, uh, which was uh, sometimes, um, currently it's Ukrainian, sometimes it was part of the, the Polish Empire, uh, it was mostly Hungarian and Russian at the time but a significant population was German, and that's where most of those people came from. And they came to a part of the world which uh, at that time had only very recently become known as Canada, because of course Canada was a name that was originally applied only to what is now the province of Quebec, and then that expanded when empire loyalists who rejected the American Revolution came northward into what is now Canada, creating the British Upper Canada and the Francophone Lower Canada, Ontario and Quebec. And those provinces uh, then united with the colonies of the Maritimes uh, to become Canada, a country of Canada, uh, which then expanded just two short years after, uh, what 1867 here, it should be 1869, my apologies, uh, Confederation was 1867, Rupert's Land was annexed by Canada in 1867. And so that area in the, that vast center of northern North America uh, was part uh, of the British Empire, but was not formally part of Canada until just two years after uh, Canada became a country itself. <clears throat> the, this area, when it became Canada, uh, there was a great desire, a great sense of opportunity, a great sense of, uh, of destiny, really, among the Canadians, the upper lower Canadians and the maritime provinces, that Canada would grow to be a great nation, a great country. Wilfrid Laurier, in the late 19th century, proclaimed that the 20th century would be Canada's century. Of course, the Soviet Union, America, and a bunch of other places sort of didn't agree with that and, and created uh, quite a bit of waves themselves, uh, but there was a sense of optimism, and the idea was that Canada needed to expand so that it became a continental uh, uh, country in the same way that the United States had, and Rupert's Land was of course the first step in moving westward to reach the Pacific Ocean to make Canada genuinely a country from sea to sea, <coughs> and then eventually when it goes north, uh, north of 60 in the 1880s, from sea to sea to sea in the north. It was an area, at that time, of course, it was populated by First Nations people, where we are right now, Rupert's Land, the Great Plains. Um, and it was uh, an area that had a, a significant Métis community, and, and that was also a diverse community, not a cohesive community necessarily. Uh, and an area that people in Ontario, and especially those who were of North Irish Scots uh, descent, uh, which is where my grandfather on the other side came from, um, looked really down their noses at the people who were Francophones uh, and uh, in a hierarchy, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more in close. I'll go back. 
So the Canadian government had this desire to, uh, to move across the continent, to, to be a nation, a large nation state with a gigantic vast tracts of resources that would then establish a big population. Uh, but they were worried that the United States, which had uh, a history of sort of bumping into parts of uh, what used to be Mexico and then annexing them and making them part of the United States, right? So Texas, Arizona, California. Um, and there was a concern that they would do that heading northward as well, especially after their giant civil war had ended and they had the world's largest standing army and nothing to do with it. Uh, so uh, there was a concern that they might try to put it to use by annexing Canada. <clears throat> and so the Wilfrid Laurier government sought to bring in settlers to populate the Canadian prairies. And they principally looked to Britain. And so you can see here the on the one side, this is a gigantic arch covered in uh, uh, actual cedar and, and fir boughs that were brought from Canada. I don't know exactly how they kept it all fresh to create this gigantic sort of sales uh, place, uh, of, of, of a fair-like atmosphere to entice British settlers to come to the prairies and, and become farmers and to, to build Canadian prairies as a British place. As you can imagine, this didn't resonate the same way in Quebec, and there's been that sort of the two solitudes in Canada, the two, those two communities. Um, of course, there's many more communities, but, but those are two dominant ones. And there was an idea that the, the prairies was uh, being sold as sort of the ideal farmland, a place where the land was rich, the soil was rich, crops would be easy to grow, and that soon there would be a railroad that would span across the prairies and bring um, resources out to the uh, industrial areas of Toronto, Montreal, Windsor, and Kingston, um, and then uh, at the same time bring industrial products, tractors, and things back into the prairies. So this was all part of a, a national policy, John A. Macdonald's national policy, followed by Wilfrid Laurier, who decided that it would be populated. It was time to move quickly to get people into these areas. But Britain wasn't the only place that they were looking for, for new immigrants. They were also turning to Europe. Um, and so you can see there was a, 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 an entire advertising campaign that targeted Europe for bringing people out to the prairies, trying to sell the prairies to, to Europeans. Um, and, th and this was an expensive campaign. It cost a lot of money back in the day. And it was, for the most part, a somewhat dishonest campaign. Because the way they portrayed the prairies uh, was really speaking to a climate that would be much more like um, uh, southern Kansas or, or somewhere <laughs> of that nature, not um, central Saskatchewan. There has been a bit recently in Saskatchewan uh, sort of popular culture a sense that the vast majority of people came from Russia. Uh, there were the, the Ukrainians, uh, the Poles, the, the Mennonites, uh, and, and etc. Uh, but in fact, that, that's not quite the case. Those communities have done a very good job of, of bringing their history on the prairies uh, to the public consciousness. And I know other groups, like the German community, are starting to also look to articulate that history in some way as well. So. It's important to think that uh, if you look at this map that was put together, I didn't do this map, so I apologize, I wasn't able to sort of crop off the other edges. I, I copied this out of Annapolis. But this shows the, the populations um, coming to the prairies, and in particular, the, what were then the territories of, of Cinnabonia and Saskatchewan, which doesn't look like Saskatchewan does today, um, and where they came from. So to kind of help you, if you can see here, uh, in the year 1901 alone, and this, so this was a, a an analysis that was looking at 1881 to 1901. But in the year 1901 alone, uh, there were over 2,000 people who came to Saskatchewan uh, from the United States. And that made up approximately 3% of the population moving into this area. Uh, from the British Isles, there were over 10,000 people. And that made up roughly 11% of the population coming into the what is now the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, from Germany, just barely over 1,000 uh, people. And, and again, when they say Germany here, they don't necessarily mean the German state as it's measured today, but roughly that. That's only 1%. That's not very big. Um, if you were to look over here, though, uh, the green arrows represent immigration from other parts of Canada. And so from other parts of the Northwest Territories, so uh, Athabasca and, and areas, we had over 31,000 uh, people moving into what is now uh, central and southern Saskatchewan. And then from Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, um, 16,000. 4,000 and 1,500 people, uh, respectively, from those regions. So the vast majority of people coming here were from Canada, um, many of whom, of course, had been born in, in Britain, uh, but, but were at least second generation Canadian. And then beyond that, uh, it was Britain was the next big place, the United States, uh, and then moving downward. <clears throat> 
people have often made the joke, uh, one of my colleagues was had, had it down pat, he would often say, you know, Saskatchewan, it's the hardest province to spell, um, but the easiest one to draw. Um, and uh, if you look at the, uh, back before we became a province in 1905, uh, the territories, this was part of the Northwest Territory, the, the headquarters of which the capital was in Regina. Uh, you can see the Assiniboia in the center, the postage stamp province of Manitoba uh, to the right, and above that is Saskatchewan running east-west as opposed to north-south. So it's, it's a different way of thinking of the prairie provinces or the prairie spaces that we're accustomed to now. But this was, prior to 1905, the prairies that your ancestors moved into if they came in that time period. So when people talk about Saskatchewan, back in 1890, 1880, they're not referring to the space we're talking about today. Northern Saskatchewan was all part of Athabasca ter Territory. Southern Saskatchewan was part of the Assiniboia ter uh, District, I should say, all in the Northwest Territories. This is a bit of a close-up here. And this is a map that was done in 1901 by the Canadian Federal Government, looking at the agricultural resources in this region. And of course, that's what they were tracking. They saw the West as a place for uh, farming, agricultural activity. There was uh, a parkland and then the northern forest, and they saw that as primarily supplying the needs of the farmers. So that was a local or a regional resource that would supply the farmers in the south, who would then turn to produce crops that would be shipped westward and eventually, or eastward, and then eventually also westward when the Canadian Pacific Railroad was completed. But if you look on here, those red squares in the center, the dark red squares, those tell you the percentage and of acres that were being under that were under cultivation in 1901. So there's the postage stamp province of Manitoba, and it has over 41 million acres. I believe if I can read from here, 41 million acres of land that were under cultivation. So the size of that red square would of course spread out over that province. And then the red dot in the Saskatchewan district represents all of the agricultural land in Saskatchewan and the Sinaboya together. And it was only. I didn't bring my glasses. It was smaller. <laughs> smaller than it was in Manitoba. Um, but that represents both those districts there. So you can see that this was an area that was being touted for having huge agricultural potential, but at the time it wasn't realized. It wasn't realized. And also, it had only been a few years that you could get here uh, by train without having to go into the United States. Right? The train had connected uh, even early on, the train would bring you from um, Chicago uh, into South Dakota up to Winnipeg and then over to Regina and it wasn't until later that it was connected so that you could cross Canada completely in Canada by train. <coughs> so when they arrived here, when German people arrived here, uh, they immediately found themselves to be an ethnic and a linguistic minority. And for some of those people, this was a very strange and new experience. They were coming from areas that had been predominantly German-speaking, German cultural spaces. But for some of those people, they were coming from areas where the surrounding populations were largely Ukrainian or Polish, um, for example, or Russian. And so they lived in small German ethnic communities. And so for some people coming here, what they, they found and experienced was not that dissimilar to what they had been experiencing in Europe. That is to say, a German village uh, surrounded by people outside of that who had a different religion, a different language than they had themselves. The Germans who came here from all over uh, settled in, in, started to settle in sort of scattered places throughout the prairies. They got to choose where they wanted to go for the most part. They had these, seen these wonderful pamphlets that made it all sound like a utopia, um, but when they got here they realized it was going to take a lot of work. Um, but Catholics and Protestants often came together, so they would have villages, but close enough together, Lutherans, Catholics, sometimes Anabaptists, uh, so that they would share some resources, uh, that is to say, some infrastructure, some local government infrastructure. Uh, not always, but, but regularly. And what this was doing was actually creating sort of a sense of a Germanness that transcended a German Lutheran identity, or a German Catholic identity, or a German Anabaptist identity. And then this way, again, it was similar to those communities that had pre-existed uh, that area of Galicia where the majority of these people came from. The German Mennonite community was a little bit different uh, and to this day have remained somewhat distinct from the larger, uh, broader uh, German community, uh, other German communities. Um, for the most part, the Mennonites were seeking to stay to themselves. Um, they came here with specific guarantees from the Canadian government that they would be exempt from military service, that they would have local governance, um, and, and they would do this uh, uh, in exchange for being good, loyal farmers who would come here and work hard and trans help to transform this land into a place where they would be loyal to the Canadian government, helping to keep it settled by people who weren't um, thinking about annexing it to the United States. 
We know from some of the diaries that were left behind and some of the oral history uh, activities that were done in the subsequent generations that within about a decade, um, most of the German immigrants had declared themselves really satisfied to be here. A few did go back to Europe, but the vast majority stayed and talked about this place in real positive terms, um, despite the kind of conditions that they were living in. I mean, a lot of these people were living in what we would consider very rustic uh, root cellars, essentially, right? Um, but they were building communities, they were, they were establishing schools, they were erecting churches, they were pulling people together from, from over vast geographies, and they were communicating in ways um, that, that started to gel an idea of what it was to be a German, what a German Canadian would look like. Lingering, uh, and for the most part too, and I'll get into this in more detail in a minute, for the most part, Germans were seen as uh, uh, a valued uh, immigrant. So. The British people from Ontario wanted British immigrants, right? If they couldn't get that, they wanted Anglo-Americans to come up here. That was their next choice, even ahead of Quebecois. They were, that was the division that existed out in Upper Middle Canada. But then after that, it was Scandinavians and Germans who were their next preference. And there wasn't um, a real racism or resentment towards them. There was towards the Ukrainians, there was towards the Poles, the Jews, and others who came. Uh, but the Germans were just on the edge of the group that were considered desirable to come out here. But a prejudice was lying just below the surface, just below the surface. Canadian identity at this time was really anchored in a sense of its Canada's contribution to the British Empire, and in particular what was being referred to as the White Dominions. Um, and so this is uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and then with some sort of, if you close one eye, turn your head, uh, South Africa, because of course the majority of people there were not white, but they, they were disenfranchised, and so it was for all intents and purposes, a governance system that was set up that was a white dominion. So these were the places, and this was the culture that they felt uh, had, had so successfully spread throughout the world, this gigantic British Empire that had had a political history that was, for the most part, free of the sorts of revolutions that had uh, characterized uh, French history and, and uh, American history in other places, this sort of evolutionary British parliamentary system, stable, uh, with with the rights of, of people being protected, and that's what they wanted to replicate here. And they really saw that those attitudes were linked to certain ethnic communities. So if you were from, oops, sorry. if you were from one of those communities, uh, you were regarded as being predisposed to be the kind of person that they wanted here in the prairies. Now, this is an early 1890s uh, advertisement that was being handed out to people as they got off the boat in Montreal and Toronto, saying, come to Saskatoon in 1890. And I'm not sure if you can see it from where you're sitting. Um, but but this, this has uh, one, two, three, four, five bridges. It has smokestacks, factories, uh, working class neighborhoods, uh, churches. Um, this didn't exist except in somebody's imagination. And that somebody was, for the most, most, the people who had that in their imagination were for the most part land speculators who were just trying to flip land. So they would come out, uh, purchase land here, and then try to find someone, uh, the, the word sucker would come out quite a bit, uh, back east who would buy that land and take it from them. And so what they were selling was a future, not, not a present. The idea was that you could come here and you could be part of this. You didn't quite know that until you got here, that it wasn't there yet. And in fact, many people who showed up with this pamphlet in their hand were incredibly angry and there were lawsuits launched against people back in what is now Toronto and Montreal because they really felt betrayed. They literally expected there to be a city here and there wasn't. Um, but, but, uh, but this was the idea that, that it was uh, a part of the world that was on the move. It was soon to be uh, recognized by people everywhere as a place you wanted to be, an economic hub, a cultural hub. Uh, and really contributing to the, the industrial world that was at that time uh, really taking off in North America. Well, that said, they're handing out those pamphlets to people as they get off the boat in Montreal and, you know, and Toronto, um, and they're handing the pamphlets to everybody. Uh, but really, once you got out here, uh, the people who got here first were pretty particular about who they wanted as their neighbor. And so here's the first map of Saskatoon that was ever put together. Um, and if you if you look really hard and try to follow the streets, uh, you'll find that, in fact, this doesn't even reflect the current streets. So even though there was a Saskatoon when they made this map, it was an imaginary map of what they expected to happen. And there's a second map that gets made 15 years later that actually reflects the real streets that we have in Saskatoon today, the real the outline of the city, even though they weren't filled at that time, but the city lots were mapped out. But not everybody was welcome. Between Saskatoon and Clark's Crossing, just to the north, which is where sort of the university lands and, 
and now all that area. There was a lot of people moving into that area who wanted to become farmers. Incredibly rich land right on the river so that you could easily travel by boat um, up <clears throat> down the Saskatchewan River to Prince Albert and then over to Lake Winnipeg and then down to Winnipeg where you could connect with the railroad system. And so this was a very sought after area. But in 1894, the immigration officer wrote to his superiors back in Ottawa and said, quote, German settlers are complaining that the sub-agent would not make entry for them near Saskatoon because the land was reserved for English-speaking settlers. And then he asked his superior um, regarding the temperance colony charter, he says, is this an English reserve? And of course the answer back was that it wasn't. But the sub-agent, the people who were actually applying the law at the ground level, were actively discouraging Germans from coming anywhere into that Saskatoon Clark's Crossing area. And this was the case uh, right up through uh, the beginning of World War I, and then it, it gets much more intense at that time period. So this was not a place that was welcoming to German settlers at this time, and, and not just in an unfriendly way in your neighborhood, but literally a government agent telling you, keep going, you're not welcomed here. Now, so while the, that agent's actions were illegal, they were improper, there's no denying that the Kennedy government under Wilfred Laurier had developed and implemented an immigration policy for the prairies that reflected a racial hierarchy, right? So this was not, Saskatoon was not an English reserve. It was, in theory, open. Anybody could have come and taken up land here. Uh, but in practice, that wasn't the case. And even at the highest levels of, of governance, there was a sense of where people were according to their ethnicity on a scale. So at the very bottom of the scale were Africans. And right above them were the Roma, or the Gypsies. Then Asians of all types. Um, and then above that, Jews. And so you can see here, at the very top, of course, are the British, the French, um, and, and that. So there's a sense of who are the desirable people that you want to attract out here, and who are the desi undesirables. And the government had a sense of we want to attract as many of the desirables as we can, but we'll take anybody because we want to populate it and keep this area out of the hands of the Americans. Um, but when it came to the local neighborhoods, there was a sense that, well, okay, if we have to have Italians out here, that's fine, but can they be 400 miles to the west in some other place? And so we started to see the creation of ethnic community blocks throughout the province at that time, which still exists to this day. As you know, you can drive through this province and you'll come through little areas that are very Mennonite, that are very Ukrainian, that are et cetera, et cetera, as you go through. And right about the middle here was a line where you could separate, I mean, the farther up the list you went, the more desirable, the farther to the bottom, the less desirable. And this is actually the list. I didn't just sort of pull this together in a general way. This is literally the list that they were using in Ottawa uh, in this order. Um, but you can see that there was anybody from the Germans up were preferred immigrants. But Germans were at the very bottom of the preferred immigrants. In 1906, the census here shows that there were 5,800 Germans in Saskatchewan at that time. By way of contrast, there were 6,297 Scandinavians. And we don't often think of Scandinavians on the prairies. That's, it's not one of the communities that has done an especially good job of sort of telling their story out loud. Uh, 16,000 Russians, though, and most of those were, were Dukovor. Uh, 21,000 Austro-Hungarians, and those are mostly Ukrainians, coming from that same province of Galicia that the Germans came from, uh, except these were Ukrainian people by ethnicity, but 34,000 Americans. And that actually worried the Canadian government. So the local settlers out here were anxious to have Anglo-speaking Americans move in. They thought they would be good neighbors. But back in Ottawa, there was a concern that if too many of them came, they would simply say, this is now the next state. And it would become part of the United States. In 1911, by contrast, the German population of the province had increased to 68, over 68,000 people. So a rapid increase is taking place there. And as we know, even today, if you watch the news recently uh, with the discussions last year <clears throat> around Syrian immigrants coming into this country, we're talking about 30,000, I think. Was that the number, 20,000, someone remember? Uh, last year, the, the Kenyan government promised that we would allow in so many Syrian refugees. 45,000. 45,000, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't remember the number. Um, and how, for some people, they thought, that's wonderful, that's what Canada should do. But for other people, oh my God, that many? That many? You know, and that's in a country now of 36 million. Back here, we're talking about a Canadian population of around four and a half, five million people. So, as a percentage, these are, these are large numbers of people who are coming in, and from the British perspective, they don't necessarily share your worldview. And so, you want them to come, but you're scared about them. What does that mean? Now, this is a map 
of the uh, ethnic bloc uh, settlements across the province. And it's been beautifully color-coded by the geographers at the University of Saskatchewan to put this together. But just to give you a bit of a sense of here, if you see the dark blue, um, those are, are German, uh, and the light blue are German Mennonite. So I can kind of help you see this a little bit better. So the dark blue are German Catholics, Lutherans, Baptists, and Adventists. Uh, and you'll see them here. Oops, there we go. Here, 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 and here. So that's where the German concentrations were who were not Mennonite, the non-Mennonite German communities. This was a diverse community though. This wasn't a cohesive one, um, but, but they were living in an area and they could communicate with one another. And then uh, next to them, adjacent to them, and also part of that German culture were the German Mennonites. And as you can see, they were in these two sites and then down here. <coughs> and also uh, at the north end of Wide Middle Lake. By 1914, 101, almost under 2 million Saskatchewans, Saskatchewanians declared Germany, uh, German as their mother tongue. Um, and and that's, that's a significant number, but only 15,000 reported Germany as their country of origin. Now, but again, it's difficult going back and, and sort of using board, modern borders to understand where people came from and, and who was what. But even if you sort of double that number, uh, of the Germans to include people that would have been in a part of the German language area of Austria, for example, Austro-Hungary. Um, it still means that the vast majority weren't identifying themselves as German, per se, but they spoke German. Now that's a significant part of the population. By 1914, uh, the population of the province was somewhere around 650 to 700,000 people, uh, ebbing and flowing a bit. Um, the University of Saskatchewan was created uh, in 1907. The, the University College building, now the Peter McKinnon building, was up and running. We were teaching classes in a host of disciplines, but uh, Germans were virtually invisible on that campus. They're, they were not being attracted there. Almost the entire student population was Anglophone and Presbyterian by religion. Not, not completely, but the vast, vast majority were. And so Germans were here, but they weren't necessarily participating fully and all the opportunities and things that were taking place in the province. <clears throat> Whoops, sorry. There we go. Um, the cultural affiliations were very diverse, right? We had we had the Mennonite population, uh, who, who for the most part kept to themselves. The Hutterite population, which was small and in those very small colonies, and was coming a bit later, but uh, was even more uh, determined to remain by themselves. It was also the smallest population. Large numbers of Lutherans. Uh, the Lutherans and the Catholics got along for the most part, except for the Pope thing, they didn't get along over that. Um, there were the Moravians who came, Moravian Germans, who got along mostly with the, German, with the Lutherans, but for some reason, the Lutherans got along better with the Catholics for the most part, even though they didn't have that Pope uh, disagreement with the Moravians. And then there were also German Jews who came over. Uh, and so the, the population was, was very diverse. Within those communities, we see already by the late 19th century, uh, with, with I guess I would probably have the caveat out of the Mennonite community that was still, for the most part, very much sort of keeping to itself and not trying to identify more broadly. And the person the Mennonite community was very diverse. There were multiple sub-denominations within the Mennonite communities. Um, but in the non-Mennonite other German communities, there was a real effort to try to say, let's be German. Let's identify ourselves as German. And so what we see in Canada is a sense of German nation building Right? that didn't exist back in, in Europe. It was a sense that these Germans felt that given how different the people are around us, the Francophones, the Anglophones, the Americans, um, we have something in common that we should hold on to and retain. And that's really the spirit behind the organization that's sponsoring the talk here tonight. <coughs> and as I said, they were regarded as desirables. And some of the earliest industrial uh, buildings that came up here in the, in the early 20th century, once they started to let uh, German settlers uh, onto the west side of Saskatoon because the east side is where they were really keeping them out in those earlier years. Um, they're right away working in sort of the industrial area of Saskatoon and very valued uh, in those areas and others. And then things change. In 19, the summer of 1914, uh, the, uh, the Germans and the, and the British Empire uh, go to war. And I say the British Empire because Canada did not declare war. Uh, Canada was automatically at war in 1914 when the British Parliament declared war. Um, that's not the case in World War 
won. We uh, politely debated for a week uh, and then declared uh, war in support of England. Um, but we took a week to show that we were independent, even though there was no question that we were ever not going to declare war. So in 1914, we really see those underlying that underlying racism that existed among the Anglophones, the Protestant Anglophones for the most part of the province, um, that just comes to the surface. And, and, it, and it, it is uh, uh, vicious. Um, so Germany is vilified. Germany is the, the evil, barbarous monster that has attacked poor Belgium. Now, of course, Belgium, the Belgian Congo, under the Belgian king, uh, the atrocities committed against the Congolese population by the Belgians were, were phenomenal, absolutely just off, off the scale. Like, uh, this was, uh, here we were in the early 20th century with a form of direct slavery taking place in the Congo that would have put um, Southern Americans in Alabama to shame in the 1840s and 30s, right? This was just brutal uh, racist exploitation and, and violation of people down there. But back home in, in Europe, the people who ran that colony were, of course, the, the, the vulnerable and, and poor uh, defenseless Belgians who were being attacked by the Germans. The Germans, uh, early on in the war, started to use technologies and, and act in ways that, that really were different in some ways. And so you can understand why the attitudes towards the Germans were so hostile, so negative in the early years. The Zeppelins, the Gotha that were used, these gigantic floating airships that would drop bombs down onto civilian populations in Britain. This, this was uh, appalling to, to the British population and to the Canadians back home. It was part of the first sort of real movement of the entire, uh, in, in the 20th century we see that in the uh, mobilization of entire countries and their economies into war and we see uh, you know cities and towns being obliterated as, as the front lines move back and forth um, but, but what we're seeing here is a type of warfare uh, that, that was being publicly transmitted through mass media information was circulating really quickly and we were seeing new technologies that were being used to uh, for the purpose of instilling terror on, on civilian populations and the Germans perfected this early on and the Western media picked up on it quickly. Uh, of course, we have uh, in the spring of 1915, at the Second Battle of Ypres, uh, the Germans used chlorine gas for the first time against the Allied forces. And those Allied forces that they used it against were um, uh, French colonial troops from, uh, from Senegal and uh, Canadian troops from, from uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. And so we, we encountered that what was seen as an incredibly barbarous form of warfare, le leaking a toxic gas out into a field. Um, and the Canadians uh, took that first. And so for the rest of the war, uh, Canadians actually retaliated against the Germans and had a reputation of being, they, they were proud of it, of being the shock troops of the British Empire. Um, and when we started to uh, sort of spearhead the attacks against the Germans, uh, the Canadians used more uh, uh, gas-loaded uh, uh, artillery shells and, and uh, fragment shells that were meant to just tear bodies to pieces than the Germans did, uh, coming the other way, because we were so determined uh, that we would repay the Germans for what they had done to us. But of course, in, immediately in doing that, we descend uh, down to and below the sort of thing that we were reacting against. The Second Battle of Ypres um, is, is uh, this moment in Canadian history that, that we see ourselves as great heroes. The, the French colonial troops uh, ran away. They were terrified of the gas, rightly so. Uh, Canadian troops backfilled their lines and held them against the movement of the, of the German infantry as they moved into those positions and following the wave of the, of the chlorine gas. The Canadians, uh, it was reportedly a, a high school teacher from Saskatchewan who recognized the chlorine smell and quickly passed the word up and down the front lines that if people urinated into their handkerchiefs and held the ammonia over their noses, that this would neutralize to some degree the chlorine gas. Um, and so those sorts of stories came back to Canada that really uh, inspired Canadians about their own military uh, uh, sort of sense of self um, and that really also portrayed the, the Germans as the most barbarous and uh, unhuman people that there could be. Saturday Night Magazine uh, during the war insisted that, quote, the only, only the complete destruction of Germany would benefit humanity and extend the bounds of freedom. Canadian papers covered the story, uh, which it, uh, for a long time uh, this was thought after the war to have been apocryphal, that it didn't happen, but in fact we actually know now that this, this did happen, um, that a Canadian soldier was taken and crucified by German soldiers uh, in the First World War um, and his body left to hang there. 
Um, so this story circulated all through uh, Canada. And in fact, after the war, during the talk, peace talks at Versailles, a Canadian artist created a, a, a statue, a carving of, uh, of this crucifixion that was unveiled in front of the German delegates, who became so upset that they almost marched out of the Versailles Peace Conference and restarted the First World War because peace had not been declared. It was simply an armistice at that point. Um, but and it gives Canadians though saying that you know we have been treated literally like Christ crucified uh, for civilization and everything that Christianity uh, stands for uh, by the German soldiers, by the barbarous Germans. In Saskatoon, <clears throat> if you read the newspapers, women here would take public oaths at, on on the streets, in squares, in churches that they would never in their entire lives purchase anything from a person of German ethnicity. They would completely destroy the local German economy. Germans were dehumanized. There's the idea that there was a culture versus a Western civilization. That there was, on the British side, humanity, and on the German side, barbarism. And those attitudes made tensions between people here in the prairies incredibly tense. The militarism. Uh, over and over again in the, in the propaganda posters that were being produced by the Canadian government, we see German people being portrayed as brutish gorillas and chimpanzees, savage. Back here in Canada, of course, some, some Germans, were, uh, people of German descent, were conflicted here, some of them. Some of them were very keen to sign up and fight for Canada. The, the British Empire, because this was their home and this is where they were from. Um, others wanted to simply stay out of it. The Mennonite community came here with guarantees that they would not be forced into military conscription. Uh, but for all Canadians, at that time there was a sense, not just a sense, but there, it was stated by the government that there could be no rational opposition to something so barbarous and heinous as the Germans. And so people who literally went up and said, I oppose the war on principle, were placed in insane asylums because they must be crazy. How could you not want to fight against the barbarous German? You're either a coward or you were insane. On the prairies, there were over 8,000 people who were labeled enemy aliens by the Canadian government and placed in internment camps. And of those, just over 2,000 were Germans. Due to their objections to military service, the Mennonite community in particular were viewed with suspicion. In 1919, the Canadian government placed a ban on all future Mennonite immigration in Canada. There was a sense, even as the war ended, that once a German, always a German, as this poster illustrates. The same people who would bayonet Belgian babies, and we actually don't have evidence of that ever happening, this is an apocryphal story, uh, would become the German businessman who would want to exploit you back here in Saskatoon, or Moose Jaw, or Calgary, or Edmonton after the war. So don't forget, but that person is that person. So real racism, the idea that you don't judge anybody by their individual actions and character, but you judge them by their ethnicity, by their language. Now in 1922, it's important to say um, that prohibition against Mennonite immigrants was lifted, um, and as a result, over 20,000 Mennonites were provided entry into Canada and rescued from a really uh, vicious persecution that they were facing in the post-communist revolution Russia. Here in Canada, though, there was the idea, a sense, that it was the British who won the war. That the Quebecois, the Francophones, despite the fact that their French ancestors were the ones who were being invaded by the Germans, had for the most part sat idly by throughout the war, and that the, the Germans and, uh, and others were uh, people of suspicion, right? And even the Ukrainians and others who came from a part of the Polish, Russian, Ukrainian part of the world, the Slavic people, were also viewed with suspicion, especially after the Russian Revolution. So a Scotsman and an Englishman, that was seen as what it was to be a Canadian. And this made it very difficult for people of German ethnicity to simply even go into a store in Saskatoon and buy groceries. When these veterans returned after the war, uh, they felt that the country owed them something, and that any Germans who were here were people that they would have preferred to have killed in the First World War. And so we see these kinds of protests. <coughs> we will maintain constituted authority, law, and order. They're saying, they're, they're labor protesters here, right? They're saying, we're not trying to have a Russian revolution. 
you know, we law, order, we're, we're respecting all of that. Um, down with the high cost of living, right? But in the biggest letters, right? To hell with the enemy alien. God save the king. Right? So you can imagine if you were Mennonite, if you were uh, Moravian, if you were German of any kind, trying to come into the streets of Saskatoon or Moose Jaw or Winnipeg or Battleford, um, these kind of marches were taking place up and down the streets. And in fact, one of the projects we're working on right now at the University of Saskatchewan is documenting what we're, what's referred to as sort of the intangible heritage. Places that aren't necessarily a building. Now, we can protect a building because we can see a beautiful building. But what about the place where something happened? What about the place where this march occurred? And the message that that march was giving? That is something we need to remember because we don't want to see that happen again. But that's intangible. And so we're actually starting to map and document those things right now with students at the University of Saskatchewan. So, so that these sorts of stories where perhaps your ancestors, because of the marginal spot that they were in society, didn't leave a building behind that we can protect and preserve. Right? They lived in Saudis, they had small wooden buildings and houses, um, but they had a history that was here. In the 1920s, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is on the rise all through the United States where it's being targeted in the South against African Americans who uh, are sort of trying to achieve civil rights, uh, civil liberties. In um, uh, uh, Oregon, the uh, Ku Klux Klan is targeting for the most part Roman Catholics because it's seen as a threat to the Protestant idea of America and people who pay their first loyalty to a, a far off Pope. And here in Saskatchewan, um, it took that same form. So in Saskatchewan, it was people of British Protestant descent who were opposed to Germans and to Catholics. And that was the focus of the Ku Klux Klan. And Saskatchewan had a bigger Ku Klux Klan than anywhere else in Canada. And the story of that Klan is a dark and twisted one in our history. Because it turns out that the original Klan organizers were charlatans. They went around the province and got people to pay money to join the Klan. Then they took off with the money. <laughs> But instead of Saskatchewan's population hanging their head in shame and saying, oh my God, not only was I duped, but I was a racist monster. What was I doing joining the Ku Klux Klan? Instead, two young Saskatchewan boys in their 20s said, well, let's start a real Klan. <laughs> and Saskatchewan rallied behind that. And so we had crosses burning in Regina. We had crosses being burnt on the lawns of Germans in Bigger. We had crosses being burnt on the lawns of people uh, uh, in Moose Jaw. Uh, I haven't found any evidence here in Saskatoon, but the Ku Klux Klan was having meetings in Saskatoon and was marching down the streets of Saskatoon to intimidate Germans, right? Um, <clears throat> the Ku Klux Klan of Canada asserted that it was rooted in this region, right? Uh, a major concern for them was the idea that Roman Catholic French schools uh, were, were teaching kids uh, to, to speak, uh, in, instructing them in a language that wasn't English. Uh, and in a religion that wasn't uh, defer deferring to the queen, right, or the king at that time. And so there's this sense, right, as you see in the bottom here, in the newspaper uh, from the Western Freedmen, uh, Protestant children compelled to kiss a crucifix as a form of punishment. This is what they were saying was that the German Catholics were doing to young Protestant kids who were attending their schools in small rural communities where there wasn't both a separate and a public school, but only enough people for one school. So these were the, the monsters that the Klan was out to get. Um, uh, German nuns. Uh, these were the people, uh, the, the Hellcats, as they were calling them. So here you can see on the back of a pamphlet, we have uh, some wonderful collection, historical artifacts in the uh, University of Saskatchewan uh, Special Collections Archives, uh, pamphlets that were literally being passed out by the Klan as they tried to recruit members. And here, here's what one of them said on the back. Would you like to have, <clears throat> would you like to have a black skirted she cat of a nun teach your children in public school? Then chasing your, or, Chastising your child to make it kiss the forbidden image, the crucifix? Better wake up before it's too late and have a revolution. For as sure as you're alive, blood will be spilled if the Protestant people don't band together. Very similar types of language south of the border uh, today. Um, but, but this was Saskatchewan. Um, and these, were the, these women were the threat. So if you want to be a Klan member in Saskatchewan, you could actually get the special Canadian Klan uniform, which came with a maple leaf on the front, so you could distinguish yourself from your American Klan relatives. And if you went to Klan conventions elsewhere, people right away know that you were a, a good Canadian Klansman. Uh, I mean, it was uh, uh, appallingly normalized, is what happened back then. And again, 
when I look south of the border, I see things that concern me today um, because they're not all that different. Moose Jaw was the, the headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan. Crosses were being burned on, on the lawns of Catholic churches uh, and on the lawns of prominent, uh, uh, sorry, lawns of German Catholic churches and on the lawns of prominent uh, German members of the community in Moose Jaw. Now, in this talk, I said that this was a diverse community and it was on a contested land. And what I've told for the most part uh, in the story is the history of German people who've come here, tried to make a living, came here, uh, really in some ways they were, they were uh, given a false bill of goods, you know, that they were coming to this wonderfully warm place to grow crops. Um, and, and, but they got here and they, and they stuck it out anyway. And they became really good citizens, upstanding citizens here in Canada. Um, and, and eventually sort of pulled themselves together. Uh, religious differences that had been a big thing back in Galicia and back in Germany uh, were overlooked in many cases as these, people, these communities came together and formed a German unit. But they weren't moving into an empty space. And the story I just told you might all, you know, you could be forgiven if you were to hear just that part of the story to think that they were just moving into a big empty vacuous place where there were no people. Lots of land that could be tilled and turned into farmland, but no people. But of course that wasn't the case. Uh, the Canadian Prairie Provinces and the whole central part of Canada are covered in uh, treaties, Indian treaties that we have. And if we were to break away from the idea of treaties, which is a, a political boundary based on you know, who signed what with what benefits, if you were to think of Canada, in fact, there are these gigantic areas uh, that are distinguished by people of the same cultural group, even if they spoke some different languages. So the Algonquin language, right? The Athabasca language, the Simshian language, the Salish, the Kootenai, the Sioux. <laughs> All of these are distinct indigenous communities that are as different from one another as Finnish people are from Bulgarians, from Italians. Um, this was a very, very diverse place made up of very diverse people. Uh, here's another map that, that goes, uh, subdivides those big groupings that I showed you even further into smaller areas that show where the Dakota, Lakota uh, are all part of that Sioux family. And of course, Sioux is the word that their enemies call them. They, they don't like that name themselves. Um, the Bene, the South Slavi, the Dog Rib, the Plains Cree, the Bush Cree, the Swampy Cree, all of these diverse indigenous people were here on the prairies. But when your German ancestors arrived, they didn't have to fight the indigenous people for that land. Right? So something had already taken place here. The indigenous people of this province had already been gathered up and placed on reserves. They'd been, they'd been removed from the land. And now their primary source of the primary resource, their food source, the bison, uh, had already been taken away <coughs> from them. And so indigenous people in the 1870s and 1880s were very, very keen to sign treaties with the Canadian government because they could see that their primary food source, their way of life, was diminishing right in front of their eyes. Within a generation, the bison go from being numerous to being a threatened, almost extinct species. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, they, they turned to the Canadian government and tried to work something out. The Canadians were moving in. They were concerned about American expansion to the north, but there was an indigenous population here. One way to think about how we relate to one another as Canadians in this multicultural society is to think of the different ways that Canadian society is divided. We spend a lot of time, thankfully, talking about how we can be united, what we have in common, what unites us. Um, but it's good to be aware of the things that sometimes divide us. And I don't mean that just in the ways that can be turned into something negative, like prejudice and racism, um, but other ways. So in the same way that certain individuals find themselves with more power, more prestige, and more wealth, so too do certain ethnic groups and certain communities possess different levels of power, different prestige, and have different wealth in relationship to one another. That chart I showed you earlier that showed the Germans right in the middle and just barely above undesirable, right, with the British at the very top, that, that list that was articulated by Wilfred Laurier back in the late 19th century, uh, in the 1960s, a sociologist named John Porter sat down and looked at Canada and found out that, you know what? If you're Scandinavian, you can only go so high in Canadian politics and Canadian business. And if you're Hungarian, you can only go so high, right? And if you're German, you can only go so high. But if you're British, you can go right to the top. And that there's, in fact, if we're a cultural mosaic, which is a language we were using in the 1960s, it's a vertical mosaic. And through no fault of your own, with no reference to your character as an individual, your ethnicity, the way you were perceived and grouped and categorized by other people, 
determine in large part your ability to achieve success in business and politics and professional lives in this country. That has kept German people out of the top positions in this country. Now, we, we often say uh, that, that that vertical mosaic is being dismantled, is being leveled in some ways, but it exists to this day. There's no question about that. So if we think about that vertical mosaic, that's all about immigrant groups, from the British down to the African Americans and everybody in between on that horrible racial hierarchy, right? Where do ab Aboriginal people fit onto that, that hierarchy? Well, if we think of them as an ethnic community, they fit right at the bottom. And that's why they are disproportionately represented in our prison systems and not in our universities, for example. Right? They are a community that can't get to the top. That is because of where they're born, their, their community, uh, they're being held down in various ways, just as the African Americans are, just as the Arab Americans or Canadians are, and, and others. If you think of Aboriginal rights, though, those are rights that people have because they are born here and their ancestors were born here back as far as time will go. Everybody else who isn't Aboriginal can think back that somewhere in the past 400 years, my ancestor moved here. They chose to come here. Right? The indigenous people were already here. Treaty rights secure for indigenous people certain of their Aboriginal rights. And I should say too, Aboriginal rights aren't something that Aboriginal people have said, we have Aboriginal rights, we want you to recognize them because it's our tradition as a Cree person, our tradition as an Algonquin person. No, Aboriginal rights come out of British common law. British common law says, if somebody was here ahead of us, they have certain rights that we need to recognize and respect. So it, it's our law that says Indigenous people have those, law, those rights. And certain of those rights, because they have all their rights until we come along and displace them. Certain of those rights we need to articulate very clearly in treaties, so it's very clear to them that they're keeping those rights. So treaty rights don't give Indigenous people anything. What treaty rights do is recognize the rights that they are going to retain, not give up. What treaty rights do, though, is they give all of us, all of us German people, rights in Canada. Because without the treaty, under the British Constitution, the Canadian Constitution, we have no right to be here. Once those treaties are signed, the land opens up, we can have fee simple land, we can have local self-governance, we can have economic freedom, we can send our kids to school, we can educate our kids in our traditions. Those are all our treaty rights, right? And so as, as people in Canada, Saskatchewan residents, we have treaty rights, which we've acquired, right? Indigenous people have treaty rights which they have retained. And that's an important distinction that doesn't get talked about enough in Canada. And that means that they're different than other ethnic minorities. Because no other ethnic minority has those rights. Other ethnic minorities come here and they acquire Canadian rights as part of their citizenship. Indigenous people have something deeper than Canadian citizenship that is recognized by the Canadian Crown. That's a, 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 a way to explain settler colonialism. So when your ancestors came here from wherever it was, Germany, Galicia, Austria, uh, Russia, wherever it might have been, they came here and they settled in a space that was being colonized. They didn't settle it and colonize it from the top, like the British, or right below them, like the French. They were down here, but they were still colonizing somebody else's space. The Canadian government created a pass system it's been determined that it was illegal, but they operated it anyway. It was determined it was illegal many, many, many years ago, 80 years ago, uh, 90 years ago. But they continued to run it right up until after the Second World War, which told Indigenous people they could not leave the reserve without a pass from the Indian agent that said where they were going and how long they would be there. They didn't have the simple mobility right that every other Canadian has. And of course, the reserve land that they were given was the most marginal and unproductive agricultural land in the province so that your ancestors would have the good land, the better land. It was still frozen nine months out of a year, but it was better than <laughs> the land that the indigenous people had. So settler colonialism is a form of colonialism, and it's not the same as the colonization of, say, when the Germans attacked Poland and occupied Poland. That's conquest colonialism, right? And when the British attacked India and conquered India, that's conquest colonialism. And when India got its independence in 1947, 49, somebody help me out there, um, Britain was kicked out, India became 
independent. There were still economic ties and various things, but they became independent. So you can call those post-colonial societies. But in Canada, none of us have gone away. We've all stayed here. And that means that settler colonialism is an ongoing form of colonialism. And I know when I talk about that with people, they bristle, right? Oh, I'm not a colonist. My, my ancestors came here, they were dirt poor, and they worked their way up, and, and, right? And that's true. And I'm not taking that story away from anybody, because that's the story you should be proud of and communicate, right? But that story is, is part of the story of settler colonialism. If your ancestors hadn't come here, right? Indigenous people's lives and their history would be different. And you might have been an ethnic minority that was somewhere in that racial hierarchy, but within that racial hierarchy, you had certain guarantees, you still do, right, that create certain opportunities for you that Indigenous people didn't have. And Indigenous people have certain rights that they retain that you don't have. So they get to hunt at certain times of the year when you can't hunt. They can fish at certain times of the year when you can't fish. They can set up a casino and gamble because they had certain rights that loved gambling way before we got here, right? Those are indigenous rights that they held on to and protected in their treaty negotiations. So that's what settler colonialism is. And racism, bigotry, sexism, classism, all those things get overlaid on top of it. Indigenous people suffer from racism the same way that Arab people suffer from racism or black people suffer from racism. That's the same. But Arab and black people, when they come here, actually inherit something that is a white privilege, a settler colonial privilege, even though they're not white. And your ancestors, who were German, had whiteness, but didn't inherit the full benefits of being British. And so there's gradients to all of this. That, I think, is the conversation that we need to have as we seek out and celebrate and tell our story as different ethnic communities those important stories that need to be documented more, that need to be told more clearly, that need to be articulated, because everybody has a right to be proud of those grandparents who came here and made those sacrifices and, and accomplished what they did. But we did that in the context of a settler colonial relationship. And when we talk about reconciliation going forward, reconciliation is finding some way to change that settler colonialism without requiring us to go back to wherever our ancestors were from, or indigenous people to simply disappear. That's the conundrum. In the 19th century, when your ancestors were invited to come here with those pamphlets they were sending all over the place, the Canadian population, the Canadian government, the British people, honestly believed that indigenous people were disappearing and would be gone by the 1930s. Studies in the 1870s and 1880s said, at this rate, population decline among the indigenous people who didn't have the resistance to diseases that your ancestors developed in Europe and Asia and Africa. They were declining rapidly. And the idea was, we'll sign treaties with them. We're obligated to sign treaties with them through British common law. But if we don't live up to them, yeah, who's going to notice in 40 years, 50 years? Because they're all going to be gone. And that, that complacency, right, which led to the creation of residential schools, uh, which created that pass system, which even after it was determined was illegal, was continued to be uh, held in place. Uh, it's those things that are settler colonialism that we, as other ethnic people in this country, now the, the immigrants, need to think about how do we go back and make amends in some way, right? And people often say, well, you can't be held accountable for the sins of your father. If my father stole the car and then he dies, I can't go to prison because he stole the car. And that's absolutely right, right? But when Brian Mulroney racked up a big debt, Jean Chrétien couldn't say, that's not my debt. I didn't do that. That's Brian Mulroney's debt. No, because that's the Canadian government representing the Canadian crown, which every immigrant who comes here swears an allegiance to, to this day. The crown being an idea of Canada, not necessarily a woman living in a castle in England, right? But the crown. And that is something that has honor that goes with it. The idea of what it is to be Canada, Canadian. Those ideas of recognizing indigenous rights emerged from the idea of the honor of the crown, that we must treat people honorably. But we haven't treated everybody honorably, your ancestors included, because of racism, and indigenous people because of racism and settler colonialism. And so reconciliation is us somehow finding a way to soften those edges, to take away those, those hurts, to make amends, to create a space where indigenous people instead of being the poorest people in this country, are the wealthiest people in this country in some way. And maybe that's not a monetary way, or maybe that's only one way that that is. Thank you very much for your time today.
happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Yes, at the back. I have a question. Um, when you show that mine came, um, the drones have been in the middle, and then a couple of slides later you talked about Germans being very desired in France, so was there kind of a switch from the late 19th to the early 20th century, or were they only desired in certain ways, like meat farmers? Yeah. Um, uh, up until the First World War, the Germans were on the desirable side. They were part of the groups that all British and French Canadians could, under could accept as, yeah, we want more of them to come here, right? But we'd still rather more of our own people came here from Britain than those people, but at least they're not Ukrainians, right? That, that was, it's all relative. Each of those was, they're more desirable than those people or less desirable than those people. But after the First World War, during the First World War and after, Germans plummet to the bottom in a way that uh, no one could have predicted before that. Uh, yes? In, in 1901, when 31,000 people came from, from Northwest Territories, why was there this big influx? Was it a, a delayed uh, population movement from, from the end of the gold rush? Uh, there, was, there was both of those things happening. So there were people moving in from the Yukon, which was at that time part, right? There was the Yukon Territory, but, but it was, uh, there were people mining up there and throughout the Northwest Territory. Uh, there was a big turn down in the, in the uh, fur trade in, in the uh, Peace River area as well, so people moving down here from there. Um, so there was a, a host of different reasons like that, yeah, yeah. It was just basically people moving around within that, that Northwest Territory area to different parts, mostly to become farmers. Yes. Um, you had a, um, I think, a 1906 census with a whole bunch of different, like, how many people came from Germany and how many people came from the U.S. But a lot of those people from the U.S. were Germans. Yes, that's right. So that's you right. don't get counted. That's you right. Get counted as Germans. Yeah, that's a really good point. All, all of those census figures are are problematic yeah. in various ways. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 A lot of. Um, the Moravians, for example, uh, they're coming up here from the United States and into Saskatchewan, and they're German. Yeah. And they quickly cease to identify as Americans and yeah. identify as Germans. Yeah. Yes. All those German Russians from the Dakotas, too. Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah, the back there. Um, I was wondering if yeah, you've extended your research into and after the Second World War, because there's that whole period of uh, the Germans who were prisoners of war in Canada, and then a lot of them after they back to Germany, they returned to immigrants to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's something I know about only from having read a little bit about it. I've not done research into that myself. Yeah, my dad was one of those. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm really hoping that uh, Gabby and people are going to uh, help us launch uh, an oral history project here with uh, the German community, because there's there's so many stories that yeah. we haven't recorded that, that it's important to get before those people are gone. The, the term DP after the war wasn't a compliment. No, no, displaced person, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I looked up with this, you know, uh, we still have real suspicions about the refugees system. who are coming into this country, right? Absolutely, yeah. What are their motivations? Will they fit in? All, all kinds of things. Will they be a burden? Will they, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? In your previous talk, I don't know how long ago, yeah. you mentioned that um, <clears throat> with the, the beginning of the First World War, the German army invading Belgium, that the propaganda came from Britain and they had cut off all the other telephone lines or That's communication right. lines and just one. And in fact, basically the propaganda, the hate propaganda against the Germans. Was that ever discussed later on uh, no. from the, the British Canadian government? Or was there ever no. an apology for that? No. Or did that stay like no. today, up to today? <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, no, there has never been an apology. So she, the, the question she asked was uh, a, a year ago-ish or so I did a talk, and um, I, I went into much more detail about the First World War and, and the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this time I put it as part of this broader discussion. But the, the British uh, severed the transatlantic uh, communication cables uh, to Canada, uh, all except for one, which was controlled by the British and Canadian governments. <clears throat> and information coming up from the United States was also being censored in terms of newspapers uh, coming across the border. And so the Canadian population of all the British Empire and allies, including the United States, 
was the least informed about the First World War of, of all of them. We had lots of propaganda here, but we had no balance, nothing on the other side. We didn't get to know about bad things that Canadian and British and American soldiers did. We didn't hear uh, those kind of stories about the, uh, right? Whereas in, in Britain, there were soldiers going home on leave. They were telling those stories. People in Britain to actually hear the cannons uh, across the channel. Uh, in the United States, because they entered the war so late, they had a, a flow of German propaganda that was going into the United States competing with the British propaganda as both sides tried to entice the Americans to either stay neutral or to join them in the war. So the Canadians were the least informed of all uh, the world when it came to what was going on in the First World War. And all we heard were the horrible, horrible, terrible stories that was coming through the propaganda about the German people, German soldiers. Yes. So is anything known about the genesis of Bill Fred Loriesis? Did he have a committee work on that, or did he have a, a circle of, of advisors that he consulted, or did he just brought it up? Yeah. Uh, his office, um, well, in general, the list, he was just reflecting how people in Canada already felt about different ethnic groups. But Clifford Sifton, who was his minister, who was in charge of all of the advertisements to bring people into the prairies, is the one who itemized it formally. Yeah. Uh, did the Hutterites uh, come to Canada with the same promise of uh, pacifist uh, promise that the Mennonites came under? Uh, I, that's a good question. I know almost, I've not actually looked into the Hutterite story in, in any kind of detail. I know they, they arrived later. Um, they were even more isolated and isolationist about themselves. Um, and that their colonies were much, much smaller than the Mennonite colonies. I mean, a, f a fragment of the size and spread out over bigger areas of, on the western side of the province. But I don't know a lot, I'm afraid, about the, the history of that. Sorry, Gerald. Yeah. Yeah. Firstly, uh, congrats on that presentation. Oh, thank it's you. Really wonderfully meeting all these different groups of people and stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question, kind of, just curiousness about with regards to the first and second world wars. There's a documentary on YouTube that kind of a lengthy documentary that speaks to this kind of more German alternative perspective of those two wars? Has that been researched at all? The documentary is called The Greatest Story Never Told. Ah, uh, okay. I, I have not seen it myself, so I can't comment on it particularly. But, I mean, there's been a lot of very good scholarship. I mean, the, the histories of the First and Second World War that are written by professional historians in the last 40, 50 years don't just vilify one side or the other. They, they talk about I mean, you know, Hitler was a villain, nobody disagrees with that, but the complexities of what was going on in German society that enabled so many people or encouraged so many people to follow those sorts of ideas. And in fact, all the more so because of what's going on in Germany today and the United States and other places where we see some of the ideas that I think um, my parents' generation you know, felt had just been you know, dealt with. That, that those things are gone, they'll never come back again. We, we see uh, you know, popping its head up again in various places. So. Um, so it's maybe not quite answering the question, but, but yeah, there is some good scholarship on both of those wars that is much more balanced than, than what was going on at the time of the war. So, like, anybody who, say, supported the motherland and training during those wars were put into these insane stuff? Uh, no, it was white British people who, who said they weren't going to go to war to fight. So if you're a Mennonite and you, you wouldn't fight because you had this promise from the government you wouldn't be compelled to fight and you were a pacifist. But if you were a, a Canadian Anglo um, who had just been living a normal life and then suddenly said you weren't going to fight in Germany, uh, either you were a coward, was the assumption, or you were obviously insane because anybody in the right mind would want to stop this evil, horrible industrial machine called Germany. Um, and so people, not, not huge numbers, but dozens and dozens of people were placed in the same asylums because they opposed the war. Do you know how they picked the people from the German camps? I assume they're mostly male, but I mean, there must have been more than 2,000 people of Germans physically living. So why? Who picked those? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they. I mean, uh, the RCMP were conducting investigations, and and various people were identified for having, you know, uh, enemy sympathies or uh, very close personal ties or having been. Uh, uh, very right-wing political uh, statements prior to the war, those sorts of things were being used to, to create lists of people that were regarded as the most dangerous 
and, and moved into those internment camps. And of course, the Japanese were also uh, interned at that time. In, interned. It would, be, it would be interesting to um, pursue to what extent the influx, such as it was of Germans after the Second World War, was promoted by the Germans who were here and who had some sort of organization among themselves and got the Canadian government to allow their friends, their, their family members or their relatives to come here, provided they didn't have some disease like glaucoma or what yeah. have you. Um, and that they would pay their way and guarantee the government uh, and that they would not be any burden to the Canadian government. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Um, uh, the Cold War started so quickly after the Second World War that the Germans, as a people, relatively quickly went back to being desirable immigrants again. Um, and, and that happened much faster after the Second World War than it did after the First World War. So, yeah. yeah. There's a few interesting... Um, uh, sort of propaganda movies that were made uh, in Canada during the Second World War, uh, and some in the United States with, with big name stars like uh, um, uh, Lawrence Olivier, who was British, of course, but uh, that that one's called the 49th Parallel, and it all takes place somewhere in Manitoba or Saskatchewan, and uh, a German U-boat comes into the Hudson Bay and, and has problems, and these German officers get off, and they come over and they're looking for Mennonites and, uh, and other Germans to who they think will start a fifth column uprising against the Canadian government, and, and Lawrence Olivier plays a. Uh, um, Métis Québécois uh, fur trader who's in the bush and <laughs> cast very much out of character for himself. But I, I thought it might be fun to actually uh, yeah. have a movie night, like uh, show that show that film, and then talk talk about like I could give some background on the film and things after it um, because it does give you a sense of what you know that was a popular film. It, 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 sold out at Canadian theaters when it was released during the war. So it gives you a sense of at least what the average Canadian was hearing and thinking about and worrying about, or at least receptive to hearing. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, I uh, appreciate you. This was a, a, a bit of a longer evening than I thought. I realized it was so late. So uh, thank you for being uh, patient and attentive, and I, I hope you had a good time. Thank you.